All right, so the last attempt at a Dead Space movie had me slightly underwhelmed. It accomplished its goal okay enough, I guess, but I think I'm at the point where that initial Aegis 7 incident has been milked of all of its intrigue and entertainment. It sucks to say, but I think I've seen this story from enough angles and via enough perspectives already. So along comes Dead Space Aftermath, a movie that, well, tells yet another story having to do with Ishimura. But at least this time around, we're dealing with a somewhat new story and somewhat new characters. So the question still remains, will this be enough to lift the Dead Space cinematic experience out of average territory and make it something truly memorable? Well, what's up guys? I'm Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Welcome to the Dead Space Retrospective. I can't really find a whole lot of info on the development of this second entry in the Dead Space cinematic universe, but in all fairness, that's not really an issue. This movie, just like the last one, was made to fill in certain gaps left by the first, second, and spin-off games in the series, this time taking place after the events of Dead Space 1 by showing what happened to the ship that responded to the USG Ishimura's distress call. The crew that initially came across the space mining tanker obviously ran into some necromorph-related issues, and Aftermath tells the story of what happens to those poor souls after their quote-unquote rescue. Happening. Convergence is here. We shall all be made whole. Ah! The movie starts out with military personnel from the USM Abraxas arriving to find out what happened to the O'Bannon, a ship sent to rescue the Ishimura. They eventually stumble upon our main cast, the surviving members of a very Ishimura-esque situation. After rescuing them, maybe a little more harshly than they might have wanted, they destroy the O'Bannon and put the survivors through a series of intense interrogations to discover just what happened to them after they came in contact with the ship and, more importantly, the marker. EarthGov seems to be responding to this in their trademark fashion by developing a cover story and milking anyone who's ever come within 10 square miles of a suspected marker for any possible info they can give. And before we go on, we do have to mention the elephant in the room. Yes, this initial part of the movie is animated in that oh-so-popular CG cel-shaded look that seems to permeate most Netflix-sponsored anime releases. And while this is a pretty bad look, all things considered, Aftermath takes a serialized approach to telling its story with each interrogation serving as its own little self-contained short, complete with its own animation style. Kind of like the methods used in movies like Neo Tokyo, The Animatrix, and my absolute favorite animated film of all time, Robot Carnival. This initial bad CG look might be a bit of a hurdle to jump at first, but rest assured, it does get better from here, I promise. Speaking of which, the first victim of what this movie is going to call Enhanced Interrogation Techniques is named Kuttner, a crazy person who essentially has an imaginary friend in the form of his own dead daughter, which might explain why he shot at the soldiers in the intro. After a bit of a good old-fashioned tussle, they get Kuttner in a room with the interrogators and they treat him about as well as you might assume EarthGov employees would by using his fear of being burnt alive to coerce him into giving up everything he knows. Which seems to me like a bridge too far. I mean, they didn't even really ask him without the torture techniques whether or not he'd give the information up on his own, so they're just kind of doing this for fun at this point. His story gives you a good idea of what initially got the O'Bannon entangled with Ishimura in the first place, and has an animation style that looks much more pleasing than what we saw previously, but it also looks a lot better than what we got in Downfall, so we're batting a thousand right out of the gate. This story starts off organically introducing our crew and setting up exactly why they ended up caught in this little web. Apparently, the O'Bannon was called in to stabilize Aegis 7 after the events from Part 1 had it nearly breaking apart from the planet cracking process, an obvious smokescreen for the real objective, which is obviously geared towards finding any shred of info about the marker for EarthGov. Through this little exposition dump, we get to know the personalities of these characters a little better, and we get to see that all of this is happening after the events of the first game, with Isaac Clark being name-dropped in the first few minutes. A guy called Clark dropped a whole continent on it. Those events seeming to be a bit of an old wives' tale in this universe. The captain of the O'Bannon lets a few crew members know what they're actually looking for, so our guys proceed to drop gravity tethers on Aegis 7 to keep it from breaking apart, and key crew members are tasked with finding fragments of the marker. Kuttner seems to be the first to find a chunk of the marker, and he reacts about as well as anyone else who's come into contact with the thing. 
This causes him to hallucinate his daughter, who was revealed to have died a few weeks back, which is about as psychologically damaging as you might expect. The guy starts to lose it at a really rapid pace and then attacks the team responsible for keeping one of the gravity stabilizers working, which marks the end of this first little short. Once the interrogators have the info they were looking for, Cutner makes a break for it and takes himself out in a manner very much befitting of the series. At this point, we get a little more conversation between the survivors, and those of you familiar with the DS lore will probably recognize that this here is Strauss, one of the characters from the second game. After this, a few soldiers come in to collect Borges, the next guinea pig to be harvested for info, and using the same fear-driven tactic, they get his story. He starts with some stuff we already knew, like Cutner's psychotic episode, and continues as the crew rushes to get off the planet, and the absolute awesome stuff that happens as a result. That's an order! Get to the ship! Ah! The small chunk of the marker that Cutner found changes hands a few times, but ends up making its way back to the O'Bannon. But Aegis 7 blows up, and the resulting shockwave slash debris end up doing serious damage to the ship. Borges, being understandably pissed, makes the captain fill him in on the mission to obtain the marker piece, but he's a little sensitive given the death of his teammates and cousin. You son of a bitch! Given all the damage done to the ship, Borges is sort of forced into fixing a lot of it, and this is where it transitions back to the interrogation room and our Inquisitor is convincing him that he can go free now that he's given them all this info. Being the very gullible type, he goes along with this and walks down the hall talking about how relieved he is that he's not going to die as one of the soldiers proceeds to aerate the back of his head for him. Next up in the interrogation chair is Strauss, and we find out that he is most definitely in bed with the shadier elements of EarthGov dedicated to researching and obtaining the marker. His story gives a lot more insight into his character, and to be honest, I might have enjoyed a lot more of Dead Space 2 if I had watched this movie first, which is a theme common in the shared Dead Space universe. So it turns out our guy Strauss has a wife and kid, one of which he actually likes apparently. On top of that, as you might imagine, the chunk of the marker is making him go slowly insane, and he has what you might call an extramarital entanglement going on on the side. Being the ever-vigilant scientific mind, Strauss gets a corpse from the morgue to experiment on. After putting him near the shard, the corpse starts to transform, meaning this whole outbreak was Strauss's fault. And as Dead Space has taught us, it does not take very long for these effects to spread. All over the ship, reanimated corpses are creating more dead bodies to turn into necromorphs, and Strauss heads back to his wife and kid, who he then beats to death under the influence of the marker. And now would probably be a great time to talk about how this movie cranks the brutality up to 11, which I really do appreciate. I don't know, it just feels very authentically Dead Space to me. This whole family killing thing is something he feigns to know nothing about despite him subconsciously knowing exactly what happened to his loved ones. It looks like the guy locked it away in his mind to avoid the guilt. The investigators decide that Strauss has a little bit more to offer and keeps him for study on the sprawl, a fate particularly terrible since he has issues with claustrophobia. And next up, they move on to Strauss' side piece, Dr. Cho. Her arc delves into her affair with Strauss, and I've gotta say, this is the worst looking part so far for me. I mean, the lines are clean and it's pretty detailed, but the elongated faces and massive eyes just make everyone in this short look a little too damn creepy for my taste. And maybe this is a little nitpicky, but I never took Strauss as the kind of guy to be rocking this hard of an eight pack. The rest of Cho's story takes place a little before, but mostly during the necromorph outbreak and sees Cho freeing Cutner to save her own skin. The two then work their way through the ship, and obviously this brings them into contact with both crazy people and necromorphs in equal numbers. After meeting up with a few survivors, they make their way through the vent system with the assumption that necromorphs can't follow them through there, but I think you and I know differently. <laughs> Isn't that cute? But it's wrong! The survivors end up using the science bay as a rallying point, and Strauss makes sure to cement his status as a psychopath. With the hopes of getting rid of the necromorph menace, the team decides to try and destroy the shard by throwing it into the ship's reactor core and run into just a little bit of resistance. Right the captain pulls a little bit of a kamikaze stun, and the remaining survivors head to the shock point drive to destroy the shard, and we get some of the absolute best dialogue ever penned to paper. I am so fucking sick of these fucking things. Strauss gets his hands on the shard and doesn't seem keen on the idea of getting rid of it, but Cho steps in and does the dirty work that needs to be done, which surprisingly actually does the trick. Back in the interrogation room, we find out not only does EarthGov know exactly what kind of effect the marker has on people, but they sent the O'Bannon to Aegis 7 as a sort of experiment. Then the Overseer finally shows up, Cho gets taken away, and the interrogators get rewarded for their efforts accordingly. 
The overseer says that he wants to find an airtight cover story to keep secret everything that happened on board the O'Bannon and he wants Cho's help, but she refuses and gets thrown on an operating table for some kind of a lobotomy instead. So EarthGov ends up blaming both the incidents on the Ishimura and O'Bannon on Cho, and the overseer mentions the experiments on Strauss and Clark from Dead Space 2, and well, that's kind of it. So Aftermath does end on a pretty anticlimactic scene, but overall I found this to be much more interesting than the first movie was. On one end, the animation was much more detailed, and even the worst looking shorts still far outshine Downfall's best scenes, but on top of that, the narrative structure of jumping from one viewpoint to the other actually worked in keeping me intrigued. Since we have several short stories to work with, there was basically no narrative downtime. The characters were already relatively established by the start of the movie, so the rest of it could be dedicated to further developing them. And lastly, I was just flat out getting bored of the Ishimura and Aegis 7. I don't know, I feel like the maximum amount of narrative resources that can be pulled from this situation has been reached for a while now, so it was great seeing a new story taking place within this universe. I mean, sure, it's definitely not the most far-reaching or revelatory tale in the series, but it was a fun, short experience, and the constantly changing art styles, writers, and characters kept things feeling interesting right up to the end. I'd say this is definitely the more watchable of the two movies, but to be honest, neither of them are bad, they just aren't great movies either. Just like I said with Downfall, this is one of those watch it once and never watch it again type of deals, but that's no insult. It's just that there isn't anything overly amazing going on here. So a quick watch should take care of any jonesing you might have for Dead Space lore. And speaking of that, I better get out of here. Coming up next, we'll be looking at a new creative medium for this channel, so fingers crossed I'm able to make something watchable out of my first experience with covering a comic book. But until then, here's hoping I see all of you guys again right here on the Dead Space Retrospective. Hey there, fellow dorks. Thanks so much for hanging out with me for a little bit. If you like the Dead Space series, I'll include some more videos on the matter here on screen. And if you like me being able to pay my electric bill, maybe check out my Patreon page and help me do just that. And until next time we talk, be excellent to each other. Peace out, guys.